This is Dr. Neff, and this video is on precipitation reactions. A precipitation reaction is one in which dissolved substances react to form a solid product. So let me write that down. Here shown here so show some examples of precipitation reactions, and I'll use a couple of these solid products as um, examples. And what I want you to look for here as I go through these examples is the pattern that you can pick up um, so that you can that can help you identify precipitation reactions in the future. First, I want to remind you um, about the terminology here. When I write something like potassium iodide with the AQ in parentheses after it, that means that that substance is dissolved in solution or the ions are dissociated from one another and each individually surrounded by water. And remember, when I write Ki, I'm not intending to mean that that is an isolated potassium iodide molecule. Remember, that's an extended solid. So we have many of these ions in solution. And so it's really, really important to remember that in solution, those ions are separated and moving freely from each other. So if I combine something like potassium iodide that's dissolved in solution with something like lead 2 nitrate, which is also dissolved in solution, what really exists in that solution is all of the ions surrounded by water. So I have potassium ions, iodide ions, lead plus two ions, and nitrate ions. And you'll note that I kept the correct stoichiometry. There's two of the nitrates, and so I had to show that in my superscript, or in my um, coefficient. So this figure shows what occurs on a macroscopic level when we mix together solutions of potassium iodide and lead to nitrate. And it also, in the um, pictures underneath, shows what's occurring on a microscopic level. So you can see in the first beaker we have the potassium and the iodine, iodide ions. It's a clear solution. There's also the lead and the nitrate ions, also a clear solution. When we mix the two, we now get a new product that is yellow and not a solution, but we know that's a solid because it precipitates down to the bottom of the beaker. So knowing, as I said we did in the previous slide, that what's really in solution here is potassium ions, iodide ions, lead ions, and nitrite ions, nitrate ions, the fact that they start out clear and colorless, and then when we mix them together, we have this new substance, that tells us that something's going on with these ions, and um, some of them must be attracted more strongly to one another so that they're no longer dissolved in solution, but are now in the form of a solid. So potential products that could be forming are the lead iodide and the potassium nitrate. One of those must be a solid. Well, how do I know which one is a solid? And the answer is solubility rules. Looking at the solubility guidelines table that's on our own equation sheet for this class, we can just look for the different ions to try to figure out which one of the potential products is actually a solid. So if I look at potassium, here it is, and it's listed under the soluble ionic compounds, as is nitrate. And um, so we are going to conclude that the potassium nitrate is not the solid. It's still a dissolved compound. So that means that the lead iodide must be our solid. And indeed, if I look at the iodide, those are soluble except with things like lead plus 2. So the lead plus 2 iodide is my solid. And again, that's the yellow compound that's being formed in these pictures here. And you can see how we start out from dissolved ions, we end up with still some dissolved ions, the potassium and the nitrate, but the lead and the iodide are forming an extended solid structure. We would want this reaction to be balanced. I have two iodides on that side, so I'm going to put a two out in front of the potassium iodide, which then also requires a two in front of the potassium nitrate, which then balances my nitrate in the original reactant. Metal. I want to think about this in terms of a pattern that you can look for. Look at it in terms of we start out with two aqueous metal salts that combine to form 
one insoluble metal salt plus a new or another aqueous metal salt, which remember, we're not really forming a new aqueous metal salt because those ions are still free and moving around separate from each other in solution. So just be careful that you're thinking about this correctly on a molecular level. Look at another example from that picture that I showed in the very beginning. Let's look at how we could form this cadmium sulfide solid. So remember we have to start with two aqueous metal salt solutions. So we would want to pick a cadmium salt that is soluble, or in other words, it forms um, aqueous ions when you add it to water. So let's pick something like cadmium nitrate. That's a nitrate. Nitrates tend to be soluble. Then we need an aqueous source of the sulfide ion. So that would be something like sodium sulfide because sodium salts tend to be soluble. So remembering that those two exist as the free ions moving around in solution, potential products would be sodium nitrate and the cadmium sulfide. And how do we know that cadmium sulfide is insoluble? Well, we have the picture here, but let's look at our solubility guidelines again. And here's our solubility guidelines from our equation sheet. And if we look at the insoluble ionic compounds, this is the ones that form solids. We can see that sulfides, except for group 1A, and ammonium are insoluble ionic compounds. So we verified that the cadmium sulfide is the solid product and the sodium nitrate again remains in solution. So we have a special name for that compound that the other product that is still aqueous and that's spectator ions. So let's look at where that comes from. Let's write this, these reactants in the form that they really exist in solution as the separated ions. So we've got the cadmium plus two ions, the nitrate ions, the sodium ions, and the sulfide ions. And if we write our products out in the same manner, we've got the cadmium sulfide solid and the sodium ions and the nitrate ions. And of course, I'm not quite balanced here, but that's easy enough to accomplish just by putting the twos out in front of the sodium and the nitrate. Um, this is called the total ionic equation. It shows all of the components that do exist as ions in solution as ions. And it's a helpful way to get us to see exactly what the very basic changes that's happening in this reaction. And the spectator ions that I mentioned are the things that haven't changed on from in going from one side of the arrow to the other. So that here is the sodium and the nitrate because the nitrates are aqueous ions on this side, as are the sodiums, and they're both the same on the other side of the arrow. So again, those are our spectator ions. They're not involved in the chemical change. They're just spectators. They're just watching. I guess you can think of it that way. Write out this equation showing just exactly what has changed. We would write the cadmium ions plus the sulfide ions forming the cadmium sulfide solid. And this, which shows just the net change, is known as the net ionic equation. practice, why don't you get out the solubility guidelines and pick two aqueous ionic solutions that you could mix together to make the nickel hydroxide. So pause the video, do that, and then come back and watch the end. What did you come up with? I chose lithium hydroxide and nickel 2 sulfate as my two aqueous um, reactants, and my products then are lithium sulfate, which is aqueous, and the nickel hydroxide, which is a solid. 
So I've shown this in three different forms, the molecular equation, which shows everything together, the complete ionic equation, which shows all the aqueous components broken apart into ions, and then the net ionic equation, which um, leaves out the spectator ions, which in this case are the lithium and the sulfate, and just shows the net change of the hydroxide ions and the nickel plus two ions forming the solid. So I hope this helps and thanks for watching.